On July the 26th, President Truman and the new British Prime Minister Clement Attlee were signatories to the Potsdam Declaration, calling upon Japan to surrender unconditionally or face prompt and utter destruction. Two days later, Japan rejected the ultimatum. But the same day that the Allied powers delivered their ultimatum, the first atomic bomb aboard the United States cruiser Indianapolis arrived at a tiny island in the Pacific called Tinian, chosen as the atom bomber's base because of its proximity to Japan. On August 2nd, orders went out for the first atomic attack in history. The date was set for August 6th. But such was the secrecy and security of the project that not even the officer in charge of assigning code names knew what the code name was for. The Enola Gay secret remained. At 1.37 a.m. on August 6th, three weather planes took off from Tinian to take station over Hiroshima, Kokura, and Nagasaki, the primary, secondary, and tertiary targets. At 2.45 a.m., Major Tibbets took off in the Enola Gay, climbing to make his bomb run from 30,000 feet. Well, the rest of the story of that flight, we all know. Major Etherley's weather reconnaissance plane over Hiroshima had indicated that conditions were ideal for a visual drop, and Major Tibbets, having analyzed the reports from the other two aircraft, decided to make for the first choice target. So much for the actual dropping of the bomb and of the events that led to it. Hiroshima, and subsequently Nagasaki, precipitated the Japanese surrender, which was finally made on August the 14th. World War II was at an end. Aboard the U.S. battleship Missouri, anchored in Tokyo Bay, General MacArthur and Admiral Nimitz received the official surrender from Japanese Foreign Minister Shigemitsu, accompanied by his Chief of Staff, Umazu. Here were General MacArthur's words calling upon the Jap nation to unconditionally lay down their arms. I now invite the representatives of the Emperor of Japan and the Japanese government and the Japanese Imperial General Headquarters to sign the instrument of surrender at the places indicated. But the means by which the Japanese were finally made to submit started a conflict that still continues today. And men everywhere have pondered the question, was it right to use the bomb? President Truman, who had given the ultimate orders for its use, was emphatic in defending his actions. Let there be no mistake about it. I regarded the bomb as a military weapon and never had any doubt that it should be used. The top military advisors to the president recommended its use, and when I talked to Churchill, he unhesitatingly told me that he favored use of the atomic bomb if it might aid to end the war. But was Truman in any position to make any other decision? Roosevelt and Churchill had reached agreement months earlier to use the bomb on Japan. Already, over two billion dollars had been spent on the project. Preparations for its use were near complete before Truman ever came on the scene. All he could have done would have been to say no. And what if he had? when the whole object was to save a further waste of lives and bring an end to the war, wouldn't any other decision have been impossible? Yet there were some, like Admiral Leahy, who maintained a deeply critical attitude long after the war. And being the first to use it, we had adopted an ethical standard common to the barbarians of the Dark Ages. I was not taught to make war in that fashion, and wars cannot be won by destroying women and children. Well, who was right? Truman? Leahy? Which was the better choice strategically? To vaporize 140,000 people in two atomic attacks but bring a speedy end to the war? Or let it drag on with the inevitable invasion of Japan and the further deaths of hundreds of thousands of people? Well, these are questions that have been debated for the past 20 years. And people may never be able to agree on an answer to them. But one thing we do know. And that is that the bombing of Hiroshima was the most graphic wartime demonstration of man's ability to destroy. The destructive power of that bomb was the equivalent of about 20,000 tons of conventional explosives. Later, uh, a new phrase was found, the kiloton, measuring in units of 1,000 tons of conventional explosive. And now, as you know, we have the megaton, which is measured in terms of 1 million tons of ordinary explosive. Tests have been carried out in the upper atmosphere of the equivalent strength of 50 megatons, or just 
two and a half thousand times the power of the bomb that laid waste the city of Hiroshima. Such a bomb would be sufficient if it was delivered only once to wipe out half a dozen entire states in America. But the dropping of the bomb and the slaughter and destruction that went with it was not in itself a finalizing event, because weeks later, the world was suddenly made aware of a new danger, which later became known as radiation sickness. People who had been subjected to the blast became strangely ill. Their hair began to fall out, their gums bled, white blood cells disappeared, and their skins became dotted with tiny hemorrhages, and they died. Fifteen years later, doctors found other effects, like thyroid cancer, appearing in people who'd been only young children when the bomb fell. More terrifying yet was the discovery of contamination by fallout of strontium-90. Now here was a new mortifying danger that threatened the whole of mankind, which exposed the innocent to death and to disease over which they had no control. The results of nuclear explosions could carry fissionable matter into the upper atmosphere where it might drift and fall to earth on the other side of the world. In time, this matter might become absorbed in the soil, eventually to grow in plants that might be eaten by animals, who might in turn pass on this peril to human beings who drank their milk or ate their meat, allowing it to concentrate in human bones, thus causing cancer. The extent of this new evil threat is still not known today, and it may be generations before science can measure the total destructive elements of nuclear fallout. We should remember Hiroshima no longer as a controversial political issue but as a reminder of what man can now do to his fellow men. Perhaps it will serve as a memorial to show the futility and indeed fatality of another major war. A war that could and probably would end in the annihilation of the human race. This is Hiroshima today. A fine modern city rebuilt out of the ashes a symbol of a modern, new Japan. Here, by this memorial, Hiroshima's dead are remembered. Nor should the story of Hiroshima be forgotten. Surely, it is the proven evidence we need within our nuclear age memory to remind us that it must never happen again. <laughs>